Welcome to Flory Models Daily Vlog, Tuesday's Q&A's here we are on the 17th of November 2015. Uh, piling on very quickly, gonna hopefully get this done pretty much this morning. We're doing this about 11 o'clock, so we're a little bit ahead, because sometimes we don't get this up on air until sort of around about 9 or 10 p.m. UK time, so hopefully it might be up a bit earlier. Also, it should free me up to get this thing into paint this afternoon. Anyway, straight into your questions. So, Bryn asks, uh, good evening, Phil and Sid. No Sid this week, obviously just me. Um, Sid hopefully will be with us next week. Unfortunately, he's working. Uh, greetings from Sacramento, California. Uh, could you, uh, sorry, could you please let me know what scribing tool, what is your go-to scribing tool, and are your products still available in Sprue Brothers? I'm very much a new member. I'm still getting uh, ahead around the site, but from what I've seen so far, wow, thanks for all your hard work. I know it sounds corny, but it's inspired me to get back into the hobby. No problem, Bryn. Um, right, go-to scribing tool. To be honest, your good old-fashioned pea cutter. Now, this is my Tamiya one, which I've had now for the best part of, I don't know, 20 odd years. Um, and to be honest, even like changing the blades, I, I have changed them and you can hear there's another blade in there, a new one, but it's very rare I actually change the blade and all the rest of it. I have got a couple of other things in my arsenal. I have a thing here for scribing, an area for scribing. So there's my other scribing tools. These are my other sort of go-to ones. Cheap, very, very handy though, is the Trumpeter one. It's a very fine blade. It's a finer blade than the traditional pea cutter. Really, really nice. My other one, which I use quite a lot these days, and I didn't use it for a long time, but it's the UOM uh, scriber. I don't think it's as refined and as delicate, but as a general get in there and go around stuff, it's a really nice one. Also, it's got a straight blade on it as well, which is quite handy if you're doing round edges. The big difference between this one and perhaps using a traditional pea cutter, things like that, is that this one you can push or pull, which is quite handy. Uh, and on this one, you can't either. This is really just a pull stroke one. But this Trumpeter one, for what it is, I think they're about six, seven quid. They are a complete bargain. Very, very handy tools to have uh, in your sort of repertoire. But it's nice to have a few different types of scribers because sometimes a traditional pea cutter is great for doing the larger scales. But when you're coming down, you want something a little bit refined, a little bit smaller and all the rest of it, then perhaps you want something like, obviously, the Trumpeter one or something like the UMM one, which you can just get in there and pull them round. Your other fingers are also, here it is. The other one is this guy, which is literally a sewing needle in a vice clamp, okay? Still one of the most handiest tools you can have. Obviously, you do riveting with it, or you can just drag it to actually scratch out a panel line and things like that. Very handy, this one, for things like when you get filler dust and stuff like that in panel lines, you can just whip around with this one because it will basically follow anything that's already there, where a pea cutter, things like that, tend to go off and make their own lines and stuff. So quite a handy one to have there. Uh, as for products, I presume you mean the Flory Models range of products. No, they are no longer anywhere at all. Uh, if they're around, that is the last of their stocks. Um, the sales team, obviously it's separate from me now, they stopped supplying all of the, the actual shops, stockists, distributors, they, they have nothing anymore. You know, literally, the our whole idea of it now is the product is so well known and everything else, um, they can sell direct, okay, and obviously, you might notice that the pricing now is a bit more keen for members. If you remember, you're gonna see there's a discount price for it also. There's no increase in price. You think the price has never gone up on our product now in the last, how long has it been going? Eight years, six, seven, seven years. Um, it's still the same price as it was before, okay? So, you know, literally we don't have to put the price on there because nobody's taking a middleman cut and everything else. And you'll also notice that the prices for the sets are extremely keen these days. Uh, there are a lot, you basically get two bottles free if you buy a set of eight washes, you're getting two free. And the sanders, I think you're saving yourself individually something like 17 quid um, if you buy the pack versus buying them individually and things like that. So definitely from that point of view, you know, come to us direct and we can sort you out. There is things afoot next year that are gonna happen. We spoke about them briefly before, but basically um, they're hoping to open up quite a large store uh, and everything else like that. So by selling direct to you guys, it enables them to sell other things, shall we say, as well. So, but that's things to come in the future and nothing to do with me. Ah. Okay, Terry says, hi Phil and team, very new to modeling uh, and at the moment just building or trying to build armor, finding a lot, uh, uh, sorry, finding a lot of it hard, like when to clear coat, how to build tracks, when to brush paint, but I'm loving it. Finally, at 46, I found a hobby I love. I've just bought a load of Star Wars Bandai kits, but I'm not sure uh, if I should clear coat before adding the decals. Do I clear coat after I have finished 
um, the build. Also, is it okay to use a uh, hobby spray clear coat, uh, which is the can spray can clear coat? Thanks for your help, Terry. Clear coating, we spoke about this last week as well. Um, it's one of those things which is personal to you and depends on what you're actually doing. Now, my thing with clear coating is um, you're basically putting it down either to protect a surface, okay? So we said before, before you're coming in with weathering, anything else, you're happy with the paint job and you're putting it down to protect it, or you're trying to put down a smoother surface, so deckling, you don't get any silvering and things like that. As I said, we covered this at, at length last week. But basically, in a nutshell, if you are have got like a flat surface, you use Tamiya flat, you probably will want to put down a clear coat anybody's clear coat will do at the end of the day as long as it's a gloss you should have a nice smooth finish which will you know mitigate any type of silvering or any problems you can have with the deco it just makes them conform and fit a lot better than going over a normal one now it may be you're using a gloss finish anyway so that way you don't need to actually put in a clear coat but what i would suggest if you're using washes or weathering is to seal them down and a click eat your quick click quick easy way to do that is with a clear coat so clear as in good old-fashioned pledge multi-surface wax, okay? Or you can come in there with something a little bit more designed for it. So like a gloss or I don't know, we've got the, I think. Uh, we've got the clear coats down here, which is, we've got the Alclad stuff and Aqua stuff and all the other clear coats down there as well. So it is literally personal choice on when you want to do it. There is no rule book. You know, technically though, the only rule I would say is before I do any weathering, I will clear coat to protect the decals because they are going to be your weak point because you might come along with enamels and things like that, which could attack the decal, make it shrivel up, melt, whatever you're going to do. This should protect it quite nicely from any sort of weathering. And also it just gives you a protective barrier. So handling your model as well, it will stop you wearing through the paint and things like that. But de definitely it's one of those things, a bit of a learning curve to it. Watch some of the video builds about it. See some of the guys when they talk about using it as well, when to clear coat. But usually it's in preparation of something else. So i.e. deckling or weathering and things like that. Afterwards, clear coating, obviously you can come in with a finish so you could change the look of it. So if it's looking very shiny and you've got marks on it and various things, to blanket it and to tone everything down, you might come in with a flat coat, a satin coat or a gloss coat, no matter what you're doing as your final finish, okay? And you do it like that. So that is really, it on that one. As I said, we covered it quite a bit last week. Speaking of which, Ian Fox, um, unless I'm reading these questions twice, of course. Uh, hi, Phil, can you please ask the question about uh, Pledge, which is this one. Let me get the other one as well. Over here. Old one, newish one. They've changed it again now, I do believe. Um, so, anyway, having never used Clear before, but after hearing so much about it, I've decided to give it a try. I was impressed at how easy it was to spray and how quickly it dried. Uh, more so than many other expensive products. But when I watched your video on the helpful tips section, you mentioned that Clear has no ultraviolet protection, uh, so could yellow in years to come. Would one, uh, would one way around the problem be that the final matte coat does have a UV protection? Um, would that stop clear yellowing uh, or would the clear just old fashioned uh, habit that has been passed uh, that many in the hobby still haven't let go of um, with other better products on the market? Okay, the big thing was originally, the whole point of clear was you could buy it for like two pound a bottle. Okay, so it was dirt cheap for half a litre, it was like two quid. So it was a damn sight cheaper than it would be to go out and buy something like this, is that gloss? That is gloss, acrylic gloss and make it up yourself, okay? Now, the thing is, um, the great thing with clear is it's just straightforward, tip it from there into your airbrush and you just spray it. Okay, it was great for doing canopies and all things like that because it was clear as well. So you didn't have that thing of it being white and then going clear once it actually been sprayed. But they've changed the formula slightly now, which isn't so much of a problem. I think everybody read far too much into this one because it made it a little bit thinner not a problem, okay, but it is white now, okay. It will dry totally clear, okay. So it has changed its way, as I said, original. The new one looks a bit like this, okay. The only trouble with these are, these are floor polishes. They're not designed really to be on your model. Now, if you've painted a nice white model, and to be honest, many years ago I did. I did a car and it was white and now it is yellow. I haven't got it here anymore. It long since died to death, but this is the trouble with using these because in direct sunlight, they will turn yellow. 
Now, what you can do is you can buy uh, other things now like acrylic resin, and this apparently is supposed to have ultraviolet protection, but you might notice this has got a slightly, I don't know, a yellowy tint, hopefully one of the cameras either there or above will pick it up, but this has got a yellowy tint. So this is supposed to have ultraviolet protection as well. Now I've had this bottle now for the best part of 10 years, and as you can see, it's going yellow. So I think most things will turn yellow over time just because the yellow pigment is one of the strongest pigments out there in nature. You only need a couple of parts of yellow in millions and things turn yellow with it, especially obviously on whites and stuff like that. That is your natural trouble. There are paints out there which are specifically designed never to yellow, which I think are a lot better than our hobby ones, i.e. if you go down Windsor & Newton, Rembrandt paints, they've got anti-yellowing glosses, but they're extremely expensive because of what they are. Are they gonna yellow really quickly? No, they're not. They're gonna take for ages to yellow. This in here, I think it was on a model, you would never notice it at all. It's just that it has got a slightly yellowy hint to it now. Would I use it? Yeah, of course I would, I have no problem. The other thing as well, this stuff used to be cheap. It's not anymore. This is like five pound a bottle. This here, I've got one of these had a price on it. I think it was like nine quid a bottle many moons ago, okay? But with this, don't forget, you would thin this probably 50-50 as a minimum, so you're gonna get one litre. So actually, from a cost point of view, it's no different from buying a proper you know, one. And we've spoken about this many times before. It's not cheap, that was why we all used it. It's not that it's good, it was just it was cheap and it was to hand. There is other products out there, as we know, so we spoke about before. So you've got Aqua Gloss, which is basically clear, but you've got other things like clear coat. Now this clear coat I've had for probably the same amount of time I've had that one. And you can see it is still crystal clear, no problem with it. And to be honest, this one here is going a little bit yellowy in here. So, you know, it just depends on personal choice, cost, things like that. But as I said, the reason that people still hold on to it is that I think it's that mindset people say about clear coating. Clear with a K, um, it's just a term now. I think a lot of people may not use this stuff anymore. It was just that it happened to be, it's in a bottle, unscrew it in your color cup, spray it. Obviously this stuff, what I tend to do is take a bit out and I have one of our 50 mil bottles, which I don't think I've got any made up at the moment and I have it sat in there ready just to pour and go as well. The other thing as well, this stuff dries really, really quickly. This takes a little bit longer as well. But again, it's just personal choice and just way of doing it. But 10 years ago, or well, definitely like five, six years ago, clear was the big thing. Then they stopped making it and everyone panicked. And again, it brought everything to the forefront about it and everyone talked about it and spoke about it. Um, but at the end of the day, I still maintain, if you want to do, you could buy a bottle of this and make up, you know, this is a 500 ml bottle one liter of it for nine quid whereas obviously you'd have to buy two of these to do that as well which is going to cost you the same amount of money so do you just want floor wax or do you actually want to use an acrylic resin uh, which is my preferred way of doing it if i'm doing quick close and things like that but again i think it is one of those things the die hard people use it and even i do i talk about clear coating it's not always clear it's just a clear gloss Okay, just between layers and things like that. But just for speed, it's quite handy having a bottle like here that's ready to go. You unscrew the top, spray it down, job done. So there we go. But that's really about it on that one. Okay, so, is that Neek? Says, uh, I'm building a 30 second F16 uh, and I'll do the paint scheme of the Dutch demo team, which is obviously the orange lion, which you can just basically see here. Okay. So, uh, do, 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 do. how are we going to masking is an absolute pain. I bet it is. So far, I've painted the whole thing, uh, the whole of the model in the colors for, of the lion uh, in large 48 scale uh, to the of Sky Heart decals to the correct and printed them uh, on the labeling paper and using them for masking. Oh, I get what you're doing. So the problem is that it's gonna take hours to get everything, the smallest parts done. Right, okay, uh, get them to any suggestions. Okay, right, now the trouble with this is, so you can see it here, this is the one he's doing. Um, obviously you've taken the decals, you've printed them off, okay, and then obviously enlarged them to fit on here. So the main thing you've got is you've got no carrier film, so you have to line everything up on this one. Uh, the other thing as well, when you go from 48 scale to 32nd, especially on the aircraft, sometimes they don't upscale as precisely as you might imagine because of things like curves and stuff like that, okay? So 
I would, if I was you, literally um, put all the black areas in and all the rest of it as well, okay? Then mask them up. So that way you've got this early curves of exactly where they're gonna lay and everything else like that. Sorry, go back. Wrong one, sorry. Come on. Note to self. Um, so the thing is, is that what happens is, is that you have um, a good template of exactly how things are going to lie with these black lines running both sides of it. Then because you've enlarged it, then you want to roughly position everything out, okay? And then sometimes you're going to have gaps where it's not going to quite fit and all the bits and pieces, and it's going to be a case of juggling it all exactly how to go round. But I would literally do the black work next, get that masked, okay? And then you can actually then just come in with a lighter orange um, to put them in once you've got them in. But you'll give an area and try and work out exactly how they're all going to be. The problem will be is up near the spine, I should imagine, not so much just doing the head and that, that's pretty straightforward but up rear the spine because you've got the curve and all the bits and pieces like it trying to get it to lay flat is going to be a bit of a nightmare on that one to be honest there's no quick answer it's just one of those things you're just going to take your time and you're just going to push on with it and try and get the best line out you can it may be the thing where you know you have to do some little touchings afterwards little blowing things like that to join up stuff that you haven't got before it's not an easy scheme to do. That's why people don't go out and do it. Um, as I say, just enlarging decal sometimes isn't always the best way. I know from my personal thing when I've done commission work and people have wanted markings, I've done something similar and I've upscaled decals and then, you know, try to put them on. It doesn't quite go because things don't scale necessarily as you would think. Um, but yeah, it's a nice scheme. Hans is doing that one. He's doing it in, I don't know if he's doing 32nd or 48th, but um, he's got that one on the go as well. Okay, Mike says, uh, as a follow-up to my previous question, uh, secondly, I purchased some, avid, oh God, I can never pronounce this stuff, Avic Linning um, decals, as I thought they might give a better uh, effect over the wings of fuselage. However, I wonder if you've had any experience applying these decals uh, uh, with particular regard to the pre or post shading as i imagine that they would uh, they would cover any pre shading yes they would because they are a decal so it will cover um avic avit i can't remember how you pronounce it so a range of linen effects in 30 seconds um in p uh, rfc colors uh, I've also seen various uh, seen various forums that show the models with these decals applied. Uh, I believe the manufacturers do this type of decals also. From what I gather, and he's done a load of links down here below, the decals are much thinner uh, uh, and more delicate than the standard decals, which is why I wonder if he'd had uh, used these um, and if a, a pre-shading would show through or if the post-shading is the best method. Right, funny enough you mentioned this, that we were approached by them at Telford. They came over and showed us their decals. Um, they're not delicate, they are as tough as nails. They've got a very, very clever printer that prints these things how, and the dot ratio is extreme. So it's actually printed. It's not like your standard silkscreen printing the way you'd normally do decals. These are actually put through a printer and done with it. They are very, very tough because I felt them. They had half of it stuck onto a wing and then we had a feel and all the rest of it. Very stretchy, but you can't post shade with it. You're gonna have to pre-shade with it because otherwise nothing's gonna show through and all the rest of it. They're really tough though, because I was pulling on it like a good one. They're very stretchy, very strong, and they seem to conform extremely well. You buy them in sheets. They're like A3 sheets, well not quite A3. It's, yeah, A3 sheets it would be of this stuff. Uh, and you put it down uh, and then you can cut it to size and all the rest of it. Hard as nails, very, very nice. Um, I don't use them because I don't do that type of aircraft as a rule. I've only done a few things of them, but generally I'd give them a go because they do look very, very nice, very tough, and they did look nice, I have to say. When they showed it, you looked right up at it. I've never seen a printer do that type of effect uh, printed, and they had two types they were showing. They had a bit of wing, and we were pulling on it. It's very, very tough. You're saying it's fragile. I didn't get that impression. It seemed tough as nails to me. You could literally stretch it. You know, well, you couldn't do that with normal decal paper either. So, um, yeah, very, very nice. But uh, you would have to post-shade it. There's no way you could pre-shade it because it would just cover everything up. Okay, so uh, next one. Uh, Ryan has done here, we can see a little picture of it, there we go, he's done a very nice Stuka, 
So I'm relatively new to model making. I've just finished the Airfix Duca. Uh, while I'm pleased with the overall finish, uh, the white of the decals looks super bright uh, against the splinter camo, uh, making the decals look out of place. Uh, I need to soften the look of the decals. What would you suggest? Okay, a couple of different options with this one. Uh, pigment, you can use a little bit of pigment. When we say that, you could always just get a, um, a pastel, like a, a chalk pastel, um, sand it on a sanding stick or something else like that, get the dust from it, and you can gently rub over the top. That will knock it back, okay? Or you can post shade it. So by post shading, we're speaking about it then. Thinned paint, so in your case, I would go in there literally with a black or a very dark gray. Thin it right down and do lots of little light layers over it or squiggles and things like that just to sort of break it up and as you say take the sharpness out of that white and just to make it look a little bit more um, soft around the edges and stuff like that or you can literally just come in with a wash and go over it with a wash so if you're using something like the flooring models wash that's what it's designed to do you'd put a satin finish over that put the wash on it and it will just it will blend the surface and all everything into that same type of grimed look and all stuff like that. It is a ground attack aircraft. They do get dirty, so that's what I would do to it. But you could do a little bit of a mixture. You could come in um, and a little bit of post shading. So just some little flicks over it, things like that, as if it's got soot marks and burn marks and all the rest of it just over it. And then you could just come in with a wash right the way over the top just to grime it down. And if you found it still had like areas, things like that, then as I say, you can try uh, a little bit of um, black uh, chalk dust, things like that, and just rub it over the top just to knock it back and kill it back a bit. Very nice build though, by the way, and uh, they're nice kits, those ones. Okay, Ralph says, Hi Phil, I was wondering with your recent success using AK um, Extreme Metal Paints, are you still planning, considering doing a build with the Vallejo acrylic brand of metal paints uh, to evaluate their performance? Yes, at some point in the future, we will switch over and we'll give those a whirl. As I said, I was planning on just knocking together the Starfighter uh, just to see what it looked like but it's not gonna be as good. We spoke about this one as well. It's never gonna be quite as good as doing, you know, what we've done with the other Starfighter. But I think, you know, when you look at the Ducati build, things like that, there's extreme metal on that one. And also there is the Vallejo one. And I define anybody to tell me what the difference is. Cause when using it on small things, it's very hard to notice the difference. Um, but at some point in the future, we will have a go with theirs as well. Okay, so Alan says, Hi Phil, a question about masking. I usually Tamiya tape, but recently the tape is removed, leaves a raggedy edge on the paint job. What am I doing wrong? Chances are your paint's too thick. Uh, if it's leaving an actual raggedy edge, it could be that the paint's not dry enough, or you might be using something like, I'm sure I had a bottle here earlier, here we go. Uh, if you're using something like this, okay, this is the surface primer range. This is polyurethane, which has got that latex uh, sort of rubber uh, into it. If you paint something on there and then you peel it off, you'll get a jaggedy edge because this stuff isn't clean and sharp. It's almost like a rubber finish. Uh, so what happens is you tend to get a sort of jaggedy edge. What I would recommend, take a sharp knife and just cut well, not cut, but just run the blade along the edge of the tape. So when you peel it off, you're not gonna have a problem with it because that's how I do it around canopies and stuff like that. Because otherwise you end up with it peeling off around canopies and giving you a jagged edge. I always run a blade just right around the entire canopy, all the areas. So when you peel it off, it doesn't give you a jagged edge. That's the chances are it's because your paint's too thick or you're using something that's got a thicker texture. As I say, like the polyurethane paints, they do those. So just be careful with those. Okay, so uh, Matt asks, hi Phil, uh, hope you and the team have recovered from Telford, uh, looked like you had a great time. I'm watching the video and it seems like, I'm um, uh, oh, sorry, watching your video builds and it seems you disregard the kit instructions and go your own way. Is there a method that you follow or is each kit different? I'm also planning on doing the NAT for the animal group build. Do you have any recommendations for the British Trainer Orange instead of using Humbrol 209 uh, uh, Fire Orange Gloss? I mainly use Tamiya and Model Master and Model Air. Uh, thanks for doing the video, daily vlogs, uh, video builds, uh, Q&A videos. They are great, uh, greatly uh, appreciated even. Okay, a uh, few questions there. So when it comes to instructions, 
have a good look through them first. And it always says about that, and we're all guilty being males that you never follow instructions. I'm sure female modelers are better modelers because they probably follow the instructions better. What I tend to do is I break down the model into sub-assemblies that make it easier purely in the painting stage. So when you're doing something that may be uh, the cockpit, things like that, it may be talking about seats, it may be talking about different areas. Sometimes I will just generally skip those because I might have a situation where I've got filler drying so I can do the jobs later. So that's what I might do. So in something like this one, when we've been working on the Helix, Obviously we knew we could push on quite quickly with all of this. This is no problem because it all just goes in together, okay? And then obviously we've got the other areas. The rotor head, to be honest, I did that slightly separate. That came, I didn't do that yet. I, this all went together, okay? Then I did the rotor head, okay? Then we have done it in order for a change. So we have put these bits in, in basic order. Okay, this is where it starts to get different, obviously, because it's talking about putting things like, you know, windscreen wipers and stuff like that on. Normally, I, if it was an aircraft, I wouldn't put all these bits in now, all these small parts down here, purely because I'm going to put a wash over it and I need to wash them off. As I explained with this video build, I'm building it more like I build armor, because the weathering is going to be extremely similar to doing armor versus doing an aircraft purely because it's a helicopter and they weather very similar to tanks and things like that, okay? Generally, this probably isn't a good example because I am following it pretty much as it is on here, okay? But I do the other thing. When you see like undercarriage, obviously you're not going to put undercarriage on an aircraft when are you going to paint it later because otherwise you've got to mask up all the undercarriage and you get the risk of the danger of them being snapped off, things like that. So I tend to avoid those. Armour as well. Sometimes I'll do it different stages, things like that, purely because of painting. So obviously stowage items going on, you wouldn't put them on because I'll paint it first then I'll put the stowage items on afterwards unless you're going to do it at the same time and paint them when they're on board. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Okay, it's just personal choice how it's going to go. If it's something that's going to be roughly all the same colour like the Bradley, I might put it all on first then paint it afterwards because they're going to be in the same type of colours and it's just little detail works coming out. If it's something that's going to be totally different, like an axe handle is going to be in wood and it's a metal head, I might put that one on afterwards and paint it as a separate item. But generally, you want to build your model the easiest way for you, not the instructions. The instructions are showing you how to build a model. They're not showing you how to paint it. Okay, so, so you might think to yourself, well look, okay, we'll leave the glass work off and put that on afterwards. Um, you know, you might put the gear, to be honest, we're to this stage roughly here. The reason it's in clamp is because the parts don't fit and we busted a seam trying to put these filters in on the front. But like here, well, obviously we're not gonna put the wheels on because we don't wanna paint them yet, so we'll leave them off and things like that. We're not gonna put the rotor head on and fix that in now because we're gonna paint that as a separate, that'll go in later. Same with the blades and all the other bits and pieces. So it's just a case of going around and figuring out exactly when and where the things are going to be the best for you and the best times to do them and all the bits and pieces okay and then sometimes I might think um, I think we did it with the f104 I had the ejector seat I did that when I was waiting for something to dry because I knew I'm gonna to have to wait for that to dry so I might as well then I can get on with other things so it's time management as well uh, from my point of view probably a little bit more important than you guys because obviously I build these so quick um, so it's you know it's more important for me to sort of work it out how it's going to progress how things are going to dry and then I can think well I know it's going to take a couple of hours to dry I can do the eject seat at that point so I might not do the seat till later um, and then obviously thinking ahead to making sure things go in because I have been caught out before where you build a head and you suddenly think hmm can't get the seat in how are we going to get around this the Red Bull car was a perfect example because when I tried to put the seat in I actually busted the actual canopy uh, the restraint system for the helmet because obviously it was just not going to go it's not going to fit in there so again it does come back and bite you when you the instruction told me quite clearly to put it in earlier i thought i'll do it later okay didn't quite work out that way so sometimes dry fitting to see how things are going to work and then yeah i know i can put it in afterward then that's a good idea and move forward to it but most of it is to do with painting i do it so it just makes things easier to paint easier to weather and then put the small bits in afterwards. Like a lot of them, they talk about putting pitot tubes, weapon pylons on, things like that. I'll put them on at the end. You know, when it's nice, it's done, it's painted, decked, all the bits and pieces, and that way I haven't got to deck around things, and I haven't got to try and weather and get into different areas. I can do broad, big areas, and it just makes things a lot easier. But there's no real right or wrong. If you look at all my videos, they're all slightly be different all the way through. This one isn't a good example, because we're almost building it, just like the instructions. Okay, as for the fluorescent orange, Vallejo do model air 
they do this one which is really really old and it's separated so much it'll take forever to wake it up we get this one out as a joke these days uh, but they've got this one here the fluorescent orange uh, 082 uh, that's quite a nice perky one um, I've never used it but I have tested it when it first I first got it and it did look a very nice color as for that very difficult um, model master do a fluorescent orange because I bought one I haven't got it here though um, and that will be down in my paint cupboard they do one as well so have a look at theirs they do two types of fluorescent orange for that one uh, as well Tamiya they don't do a fluorescent orange as far as I know so you can have to skip on that um, but yeah have a look at Model Master do a fluorescent orange and obviously the Model Air one don't forget you can adjust the colour slightly just add a hue of orange to it um, or a hue of yellow you can just adjust it a little bit if you want to lighten it a little bit but the big thing is with these remember to spray it white before you put it down so mask the area that you were going to do in the day glow make sure you put white down first and have white as a primer it will make the color pop if you put it over something dark like gray or something darker it's going to take forever to come through and shine through so to give you the strongest possible uh, color of the actual day glow or the fluorescent colors then obviously use a white base for it okay so get a white primer down there or just a white xf2 or whatever you want to do then put that over the top and that'll help you out in no end Okay, so uh, Brett asks, uh, with Tilford um, all done now, what kit or builds did you see that were going to get your mojo back? Um, any candidates for next year? And actually, I did put up the video of this one, uh, which is the Shackleton. I love the look of the Rebels Shackleton. Uh, we've got the little video down here. If it'll play just here. It is going to play. Um, you can see it just whizzing around here. Uh, this really took a surprise. I wasn't expecting to see this on the stand. In fact, I was that impressed by this one. I didn't realize that they had the Tornado uh, GR4 on their stand because I was too busy looking at this one until I got back to our stand and someone mentioned it. Um, this looks stunning. Also, it's got the bulbous chin bit on the front, uh, which is the, um, the uh, was it the A, I don't know. I think it will show it on the video at the moment. Um, but this is the AWS2 version. Uh, so you get the bomb bay and all the bits and pieces in there um, but that is the one I'm looking forward to really going to do that kit it's due out first quarter next year it's the Revel Shackleton uh, 70 second scale and it looks a million times better than the FX one that's well for my opinion anyway I know Jen did a great job on hers but that one absolutely looked like a stunner to me and it's in my preferred one I'd like to do I like it with the ray dome on the front and all the rest of it rather than the Airfix earlier version uh, da, 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 David says, uh, just uh, to say, enjoyed meeting you at Telford. Are uh, you and the team at Telford? Keep up the good work. Thank you, David. Nice to meet you. Great to see so many of you walking around in Flory Models tops. Everybody thought you were all working for us at one point. We had one company come over and said, how many staff do you have? It's like, not technically all staff, just members. Okay, Simon Webb. Ages ago, I asked you about reference books and you said the internet is your best friend. I took it you meant uh, the internet, internet is your best friend for aircraft images uh, because you didn't say specific publications of books. Yeah, that's what I meant. When we said about it last week, I showed you a couple of books. You can do those, but sometimes, this is a classic example of the Helix. I haven't got a book on the Helix, but Google is absolutely rife with them. Um, the particular weathering I'm going to do and the style with this one, Google image search is absolutely fantastic. That way, sometimes people have done walk arounds, you can find them that way. So for instance, I just put in there KA27, comes up with all of them uh, as images. I clicked on an image which had a nice picture of it and it turns out it was walk around one and there's like 20 photos of it up there of this exact aircraft I'm doing as well. So that was absolutely fantastic and nice and easy to do. You don't need to go out and spend a fortune on books, but they are nice. Uh, what I've got is a series of books over there in a pile, I need a bookshelf. Um, and I've got ones on like the F-16, the A-10, and they give me the overall. So when I'm painting and doing like details inside bays, cockpit, stuff like that, I've got a perfect image just here next to me. But we are now in, you know, the sort of, you know, the future is bright <laughs> and all the rest of it. My tablet is now my best friend because what I tend to do is Google image search on here, and then I can go along and I can come up with the image and then I can expand on it as well. If it's a high quality image and zoom right into the area I want, I have it here on my tablet, I put it here and I just copy it and do it just like that. But 
printed media is still a fantastic reference to have. I've got a series of books down there which I absolutely love. Um, you know, Read Air Publications, um, Jake Malemphy, fantastic books. They're absolutely beautiful one. It's just re-released uh, the F-15 book with an update as well. There's some great images in there if you want to have a look at those. Um, Fox 2 did the one on the Tornado we looked at and on the Harrier. They just released one on the Corsair, um, on the Corsair 2, which looks absolutely stunning, came out last week. I'm hoping to get that one soon. Um, so there's lots of different options out there for books and some really, really nice ones for your collection. But the internet, still Google image search, pays dividend. You know, KA27 cockpit, next thing you know, takes you to YouTube and there's a guy with a GoPro starting one up fantastic you know so that's all the images I needed because I knew the cockpit color call outs and the instructions were completely wrong and then I could just see it as he was panning around watched it a couple of times I knew exactly where it was green where it was gray uh, and all the shades in between seat colors as well you know the, the version I've got the video shows them they're in black seats the call out show it to be in red again fantastic little thing to have so you know we're all on the internet Google image search uh, right okay Grant hi Phil uh, I would love to know the details of the 200 F-18 Hornets you did as a commission. Who were they for? Were they different screens and liveries? Did you lose your mojo uh, to do the same build over and over? Um, it was 257, actually. <laughs> um, were they all in different schemes and liveries? Yes, everyone was completely different. Who were they for? Obviously, I can't tell you because it was a uh, personal commission um, or I can tell you it was a <laughs> wealthy I would say uh, businessman in America he's got a private museum um, it wasn't just me working for him he had other people working for him as well uh, and I did the F-18s some of the guys I think did A-4s uh, four Phantoms but basically I did every single scheme for every single squadron uh, Marine Corps and Navy uh, and also I did the Canadian ones as well uh, and all the rest of it some did some Australian ones I think so almost all the um, uh, F-18 Hornets from A I did all the basically the legacy F-18 so I did A, B, C and D versions I did do a handful as E and F's um, G wasn't even out by the time I finished doing the, co uh, the commissions uh, and everything else so yeah, all different schemes. We had decals and then I, if we did couldn't find the decals for them, I used to custom do the spray job on them or make custom decals for them and things like that. Did you lose your mojo? <sighs> yeah, it, turned, it was like Boeing, literally. I, you know, as I said, I think we discussed it. I had a um, my old workroom, because it was a workroom before we had a studio. Um, it was basically a big U-shape and it started off with cockpits and you ended up with packaging at the end. And they went through all different versions. And as I say, I probably had any one time 20 F-18s on the go um, in different stages. There would be in batches of three in three sections. It's one of those things, you go to work, you know, you're building, but it was quite nice because I was doing different schemes at the end and to keep my sanity, because I'm not just building cockpits for two years, you know, I tended to do like on Monday, I might work on cockpits and fuselage assembly. Okay, and then on Tuesday, I'll do something else and on Wednesday, I'll do something else. But then if I get a bit bored, I could say on Monday, oh, I'm gonna do some deckling today because I have some preparing deckling stage as well. Uh, and that way you got things drying, sanding, filling, primers. I had drying bays as well to speed things up and out. But we're not gonna have three a week as a, on average uh, and all the rest of it and said the hardest point was doing the custom paint work on them um, that was the, the, the tricky bit because some of them obviously you just can't get decals for so you'd have to custom make them so that either means um, upscaling 170 seconds or downscaling 130 seconds uh, or just basically completely scratch doing them uh, and try and custom make them as best as possible uh, but yeah very nice by the end of it though, um, my contract was up for renewal and I kindly declined it. And at that point they were like, well, how much more? And it, I didn't want any more money. Also, this was just in its infancy as well. I was literally, uh, I had a bit of an illness at that point as well. And this was just beginning to get the old, right, okay, perhaps we can give something back. We can show things and all the rest of it. What I'll do is, if you people would do want to see them, I've got photos of pretty much all of them, I think, still. Um, I know a lot of you saw them when I did my photo bucket video. There's hundreds on there. Uh, but generally, I'll put them up. You know, I'll put them on the site, on the main site in a, uh, a file and you can go off and have a look at them. They're all done basically from 1990, I think now, 1999, 98 uh, to 2000, 2001 ish. That was the point of doing those. So lots of fun ish. <laughs> okay, John, 
Um, hi Phil, a non-modeling question. My wife and I want to come on vacation in the UK in 2016. Weather-wise, what is the best time of the year to visit? As anyone will tell you in the UK, it could be a gorgeous day any day, and any other day it could rain. You know, um, I'm down here in the southwest. We're down in the bit that sticks out the bottom. Um, and our weather tends to be a bit warmer than anywhere else's, but also we tend to be a bit wetter than anybody else's as well, because we get all the stuff off the Atlantic coming in. Um, today, to be honest, is a horrendous weather out there. It's throwing it down, blowing a gale. It's our second winter storm of the year. But then I speak to the guys, our barbecue, we had nothing but sunshine for in August. Um, uh, for the entire bit, well, entire of June and July, we had no rain whatsoever. Then we had our barbecue here and it rained as it always does. Only for 10 minutes, but it did rain. But literally best time of the year for us is June, July, August is that's when I would say is the best time. Over many years, we seem to have, you know, later summers, but June, July and August is the, your best time to come to the UK. Unless you want snow, and then obviously there's no guarantee of that either. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, Thanos says, Hi Phil, just wanted to say uh, your Q&A vlogs are great. I get so much out of it and really uh, learning a lot. My question is about the Harder and Steebeck Evolution CR Brush Airbrush. I'm wondering whether it is possible to fit a 0.2 needle into a 0.15 nozzle. I think I remember you saying a while ago during one of the Tuesday shows that the nozzle is universal and can be used uh, them together. I have a 1.5 needle nozzle set already but I don't want to go to the expense of buying a 0.2 needle and nozzle set if I can just purchase the 0.2 needle. Now, I lost, I think, my bit of paper, didn't I? I have a piece of paper here, which is really, really annoying. Hold that up, everyone. Uh, that's a real pain. Um, I'm pretty sure in fact, a really, really pain. I had a piece of paper which had the exploded diagram with all the parts call outs for the uh, Harder and Steam airbrushes on that really thing. If I'd pre read this, I would have had it handy. Um, okay, so after a quick look around the old everything uh, airbrush website, it does look like they are different because the 0.15 uh, nozzle is just here. Okay, which is this bad boy just here, and then they also do the point two and four. Uh, the thing we were getting uh, mixed up about is this guy down here. This is the end cap. This is what we're actually talking about. The point one five and the point two is the same one. Point four is bigger. Okay, uh, and then obviously I think you got a bigger one for the point six as well. Okay, but that is the one we were talking about. It's the universal. It's not the actual air nozzle and needle. Those both need to be 1.5s. It's the end cap or like, you know, the two prong bit and all the rest of it because the 0.15 and, I can't make it bigger, and the other one uh, actually use the same one. Okay, so if we can get this to go bigger, here we go. Yeah, that's the one there. So that's the 0.15 with the 0.2 as the end air cap. That's the bit that screws in the physical end, not the brass bit or the needle, okay? So you will need separate ones for that. <laughs> Excuse me, there we go, got to that one in the end. Okay, right, uh, where were we? Uh, right, was that the end of that page? Uh, there we go, F18, knife, nozzles, there we go. Okay, Phil asks, good day Phil. I'm looking to build three types of 132nd aircraft, the F4 Phantom, the F14, and the F18. I'm looking at many different view reviews of the builds. I'm still not sure of what brand to go for. I have the Phantom F4J, uh, Tamiya. I'm still looking for the two others. In your opinion, what is your uh what would you recommend i know the tamiya kits are good i'm just looking at the others don't mind a little challenge uh but not too much as i lose interest quickly okay well basically um uh, if you're thinking f14 i've done the trumpeter one we've got the full uh, video build of that one i think it's better than the tamiya i built the tamiya one i know the purists out there will say about the tamiya one but yeah you've got to rescribe it the front end if you go with the bomb version of tamiya 
is uh, recess panel lines where the entire back end of it is the old A version technically uh, is all raised panel lines so you have to rescribe it save yourself a lot of heartache and just get the trumpeter one beautiful kit goes together really really well and I thought it went together just as well as the nice as the Tamiya one uh, as for Hornet in 30 seconds if you're talking the legacy Hornets are obviously A, B, C and D then you've got uh, the Academy one is a beautiful kit. I've built a few of those now over the years. They are absolutely stunning. I'd like to build another one in all honesty. And then if you're thinking about the new ones, the Super Hornets as in the E, F and G types, then obviously Trumpeter is the only player in town for those. Um, and again, they are absolutely fantastic kits. If you're gonna do the F version, buy the G because it's got all the correct lumps and bumps that they forgot and missed when doing the F version um, and all the rest of it. And you, you get all the weapons, all the bits and pieces in it as well. So I've got that kit upstairs to be honest and it's something I'm planning on doing in the future. Okay, so. Uh, de -de -de -de. Lando says, hi Phil, love the site and your work it has really helped me become a better modeler. Thank you very much for that. Question one, I want to buy some lead wire from Plus Model. What sizes would you buy for 148th and 132nd scale aircraft? Obviously it depends on what you're wiring. Um, I've got down in here in my wiring set, I've got various sizes down here, but I suppose my most used ones are is probably I do the 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and one mil. Um, but to be honest, these are such handy things to have that sometimes it might be just to buy the set. Okay, you've got nine in the set. I think I don't one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine in the set. They're not too expensive, but you know, if you're gonna do it two, four, six, eight and one mil, one mil is really good for doing big fuel lines and hoses and stuff like that. But because you are dealing in the larger scales, that's it. But to be honest, I don't think you can go wrong with buying them all. Uh, they're really nice. You have got other options. And to be honest, I have a roll here. I've been using it on this one. Um, it's just to go out and buy fly tying uh, lead wire. It comes on rolls like this and it is really, really cheap. I think I paid probably the same as one pack of that as I bought a box full of this stuff for. Um, and it's really, really handy. Again, it's personal choice, hoses, sizes, things like that. It's what looks right to the eye. Sometimes in scale doesn't work particularly well, but there is no rights and wrongs to it all. So, you know, either pipe the bullet and just buy a pack of each and you'll be sorted probably much forever, um, or just go for two, four, six, eight mil, maybe 10 if you want to. The, the, the Sorry, the big one mil one. Um, the biggest thing is with that one is is that uh, you can probably get away with using um, other things for the really thicker stuff, you know, just normal wire, for instance, copper wire is dirt cheap, uh, and obviously using sprue, stuff like that for the big sort of one mil. But yeah, the 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 0.8, I use all the time. The thinner stuff, you know, is great for doing wiring. You can scroll it together, scrunch it all up, make a bunch like a wiring loom, put some Tamiya tape around it, and it looks like a loom, things like that. You can do some pretty interesting things with that one. Okay, question two. Where do you buy white tank from? Uh, what brand do you prefer here in the US? We have so many different ones to choose from. I can't remember who mine actually is. We've had this up before. I now got rid of the box now. Uh, I've got a feeling mine's from Yuhu, as in uh, U-H-U, um, white tack. It's just the oil-free version of it. You get blue tack, has the oil. If you put it on walls, you get like oily mark around it. White tack doesn't have that, okay, uh, and everything else. But yeah, Yuhu is my brand that I use. Pretty much you can get that anywhere around the world. Um, never had a problem with it. I don't have any, some people say about it sometimes breaks down uh, and leaves residue behind. I've never had that at all. So just been lucky, I guess, with that one. Okay, question three. Uh, will you do a show, uh, sorry, will you show us your Airwolf model in the display cabinet behind you? Uh, do you have a video build on doing the Airwolf by any chance? That's a long time ago. I don't know if I can get it out. Hold on, um, I'll see without destroying everything behind a load of stuff, to be honest. Uh, uh. He's a bit dusty. Uh, this particular one, we did, it's very dusty in fact. He needs to come out and be resurrected. Uh, yes, we did Airwolf many, many, many moons ago um, as part of the free um, news shows. When we used to do the bigger news shows, when these be an hour long on a Friday, um, it, it was part of that build. I did a series and we put them in there. They were like 10 minute sections each week. Um, the only thing, I got up to the part of doing the rotor heads and all the rest of it, then we stopped doing those shows so it wasn't shown anymore. But basically, yeah, he's still here, he's all done and finished and everything. I did finish him off off camera uh, and the bits and pieces. Um, as I say, personal favourite of mine. I 
love that thing. I wish they'd do a 135th one uh, and all the rest of it. But yeah, if you go back through the the shows, if you go to the search on the Flooring Model site and just put in Airwolf, the chances are you come up with a review, but also you might find one of the clips. I might have used it in some text somewhere, okay, and then pop it in, and then that way it'll give you a date, and then just watch the Friday shows, um, when we used to do the new show on a Friday, and you'll see it in there. We spoke about this one because we used obviously black work, gloss work, uh, and all the bits and pieces, but it was part of a free show, which must have been four or five years ago now when we did that one. But yes, need to dust actually. I think I'll do that after we finish recording this because he's a bit of a mess. Okay, Alan Stilwell. How are you, Phil? Hope you're fit and well and recovered from Telford. Uh, quick Steinel Res question. Uh, uh, you gave the Starfighter an initial spray with a grey primer before you went with a black coat from the AK Extreme. Would the black Steinel Res be enough? I found it gave a good surface to spray uh, the Mr. Metal colour on my F. Uh, 100C. No, it won't work. Um, the Mr. Metal color stuff is a thicker paint, you know, we got it up there. Um, it, it, it's, it goes on better. The thing is with the Steinal Res, I did try it in testing and that's why we backed out of it. When you watch the review of it and the actual full build, as you see, I do Steinal Res and originally I was going to spray onto it. When I sprayed onto it in a test piece, it was flat. It just didn't buff. You never had a nice real metal luster. It didn't give it that thing. Yet you put down their black base on, suddenly, bang, it's like, wow, that's fantastic. We love it. It's amazing stuff, okay? So that's the thing. You need to have the black base their stuff to make it really go. It's got a far, far smoother finish than Steinal Res. Don't get me wrong, love Steinal Res. It's perfect, it's brilliant stuff, but it doesn't give you a sort of extremely flat gloss effect um, and a nice smooth finish for the Steinal Res to actually adhere to uh, and go through like that. When I put it down in testing, it just went from being dull aluminium to polished aluminium. And was like one like a mirror, one just flat as hell. You know, and that's the difference between their black base and using Steinal Res and things like that. It's not so much the colour, it's how polished it is. Steinal Res is lovely, and obviously this will get a coat of Steinal Res, and it'll get rid of all the imperfections, and it'd be great for my next stages of painting and weathering and all the rest of it, so we make our way through that one. But if I was doing something you know, gloss black and we want it to be like a mirror. Yeah, if we were doing Airwolf again, for instance, then obviously I would use the Steinal Rest stuff on it. Uh, sorry, the actual uh, black base uh, from AK Extreme on it because it gives a far better stuff or anything shiny than I've seen before. So it really is that nice. Okay, uh, Dennis says, Bill, watch your space shuttle build and I notice you actually never sand your models wet. Is there a reason? Uh, <clears throat> or is it just not necessary? Personally, I don't think it's necessary. The idea we're doing things wet is if you're, you know, obviously you're going for a gloss finish, um, obviously it keeps down the dust and all the bits and pieces like that, but when you're doing it wet, when it's dusty, you can just brush yourself off. If you're doing it wet, it makes a mess and goes absolutely everywhere. And I must admit, doing the space shuttle was like doing a car um, and all the rest of it, but generally day to day around here, I can just brush off the dust and away we go. If you're doing it wet, it just stains and gets in everywhere and all the rest of it personal choice. I know a lot of guys wet polish everything, you know, but personally for me, I just dry. Also, the thing is a lot of people use wet is because you're washing out the sandpaper. Um, obviously when you're doing a car, you put it in a bucket of warm water, you know, and it, it cleans them out. My sanders are all self-cleaning. So you just tack them on your leg or on the bench and they're empty out on their own. So it doesn't need to wash them out at all uh, or anything else like that. So it just made things a lot easier. But as I say, personal choice on that one. Andy King, hi Phil and team. Thanks for a great site, uh, helping to keep us all sane. I won't go that far. Okay, uh, three quick questions. I just completed a two year build of my Revel uh, F14D. No wonder it took you two years, horrible kit. Um, <laughs> fought me all the way, not surprised. Last job was to flat coat using Vallejo matte finish, but disaster. I now have an F14 that looks like it's been sitting in a snowstorm particularly white all over, sorry, practically white all over. How do I get the gray color back? A gloss varnish to cancel the extreme matte. What's happened is you've got it too heavy, um, in too close, too heavy. What happens is the particles in the white, i.e. that's why this looks like it is, you know, obviously it's all got dusty bits in there in a solution. Those dusty bits is what gives you the texture that makes things flat. Okay, technically you've just gone in too heavy and overdone it. Instead of it being a light dusty coat from afar and give you that effect, okay. The other thing as well, if you've used, I do you say use uh, Vallejo matte varnish, 
if it was the blank top one uh, for using their mat, I would still always thin it as well. Okay, put a little bit more thinners in there to break it down a little bit more. Uh, but generally what's happened is, is you've gone too much, too heavy, and it's just built up too fast. Okay, so it's giving you a massive texture effect and all the rest of it. Couple of things you can do. Okay, none of them are pretty. Uh, the first one is to physically sand it off. Literally a very, very fine um, thing, an old sanding sponge, a polishing sponge, just whip over it. That'll take the texture down, satin coat over the top, you'll have no problem with it at all. Or as you say, try and hit it with a gloss. The only trouble is it will be rough as hell when you touch it, but it might make it a little bit better to see through and all the rest of it. Okay, uh, I'm thinking of buying a spray booth. Which one do, uh, do you use? and what features do you look for? As you say, I've got two types. I have my um, Aircom ones, which sit here, which is the bigger one, uh, two of them together. You can daisy chain them together and put as many as you like. They're half the price than the one behind me and do exactly the same thing. Okay, they're a little bit more noisy uh, and all the rest of it. This guy up here, we spoke about it. I'm just about to change the filter actually. I'm gonna have my second filter in there, which is brilliant because that one's lasted actually longer than uh, technically the expensive ones. But this one over here is a Graphic Air, 300 quid plus. Uh, not cheap at all, but it's got a great pull. It does a fantastic job. Everything goes out. All of my spray booths are extractor types, i.e. it just sucks it in and blows it clean out of the building, okay? We've got it goes up and then out through the wall, uh, and that's what it does. So it doesn't have to be anything particularly high tech. It just needs to shift air and a lot of it, okay? So it's got great draw. I can clear this room completely and no problem at all. But then to be honest, so do the aircon ones below. Have a look at the reviews on those. We've got reviews of them all up there. Personal choice. I love the aircon ones. I think two of them together makes a bigger spray booth than that thing, and it's a nice area to do. I have even considered taking that one away and that being my backup and having both the aircon ones there. The only thing is the aircon ones are a little bit more noisy, so from a camera point of view, it just tends to blow the camera out a little bit. But I have thought about actually having a spray booth entire thing along this area and doing it like that. Maybe something I'm gonna play around over Christmas. I tend to pull the studio apart and redo it over Christmas. Uh, we're gonna redo the paint rack and things like that. But generally down there, you know, I think there's a better option, shall we say. So I might be going down that route. But at the end of the day, you just wanna get it out. Don't try and purify the air because it never really works. The smell will linger. You just wanna get it vented externally. So if that means putting a hole through your wall and having a duct going through or a window mounted one or something else like that, just get it out of the room. Roughly they all do the same things. At the end of the day, it's price. Go cheap, 30, 40 quid, 100 quid, you can buy a Chinese knockoff job. Fine, the fan and them are pretty lousy. They don't draw a lot of air. Spend 150 quid, um, you can get an aircon one. 38 watt motors, really, really nice. Does a, a great job and all the rest of it. You can go for something over there. I can't remember what size watt motors they've got in there, but it's quite big. They're 300 quid, okay personal choice you know at the end of the day all you're doing is shifting air and kicking it out the, getting it out of your room or your area okay and that's really what you want to concentrate doing there is other options I know people make their own various bits and pieces don't so much go down that route um, these things have got fans that are designed to have chemicals going through them and all the rest of their sealed units and stuff like that rather than using just a fan that's blowing it through you know we don't want anyone blowing themselves up I've never heard of it before the do-gooders say hold on I've never heard of anybody killing themselves with an extractor fan that they've made up out of some you know computer parts step in bits like that but on paper it could happen that's all I'm saying so I'm not going to say do it because somebody might blow themselves up but I've never heard of anybody doing it Okay, three, did you make a video on packing models for postage? If so, where do I find it? Yes, I've done it a couple of times. Uh, it's around, again, if you use the search on the main site, things are keyworded quite well, uh, and these things do pop up. So if you put in there about packaging your models, uh, it'll come up as a keyword, it'll link you to the video and do something else like it. I've done it a couple of times over the years, uh, and shown about sending how I used to send commission models around the world and all the bits and pieces. Uh, thanks for your advice, PS. Uh, even though you probably not pre-read this, we still love Star Wars too. I'm 47, I've been a fan from the start. Uh, so you just carry on with the Star Wars videos as well as everything else you'd enjoy doing. Roll on December. True. Thank you very much there, Andy. From Guernsey. Okay. Oh, look. No, he's back again. Sorry, Phil. Uh, Andy again. One last thing. I've just returned from New York and got some reasonable photos of various aircraft displayed on the USS Intrepid, um, uh, including the exterior of the Space Shuttle Enterprise and the SR-71. 
Uh, would the members be interested in me putting the photos up around 150 of them on the site uh, on the reference uh, for site for reference if so where um, and I think we have got a reference area in the forum just pop them in there yeah love to see them I love looking through all the photos and then say great reference ones I'm truly sure we got a reference area in the forum just pop them in there and we can go from that Hi, John Boller, our very own John. Thank you, John, for helping out at Telford and Lynn. You guys are stars. Uh, hi there. Uh, been a lot of debate recently on the internet about pre-shading, weathering, and panel line washes. Uh, one alternative technique seems to be the growing in popularity is black basing. I using black base as a primer uh, to build up shades of warm paint effect uh, with thin base coats. Uh, have you ever tried this and what are your views on it? I used this method some uh, all the time when I was doing games workshop stuff years ago. I've seen AMA guys do it but never really thought of trying it on aircraft. Again, it's one of those things that comes around. You know, this was pretty much standard when I first got back into the hobby properly back in the early 90s. That it was like, you know, pre-shading everything in black and then you work up the colours in thin coats. Personally, I've got better things to do. You know, to me, you're making work because you've got to build up and you have to take your time coming up. I'd rather put down pre-shading, as I'm going to do on this one, and then I can just put a coat over it, like it, put a coat over it, fade it into the area I've got, instead of fighting against black, because black is extremely strong, it's very, very dark, and it comes back. It's a bit like using black to pre-shade or to prime white. Now, I can understand the theory behind it because white, if you look at aircraft uh, undercarriage legs that are white, they look solid, chunky white, okay? To get that, if you spray them sort of just over grey paint and all the rest of it, they look white, but they don't have that real heavy set look to them. If you put black gloss on there first and then white gloss them afterwards, they have a massive chunky, but it's taking you loads of coats of paints to get there, okay? So that is basically the method behind this one. It's nothing new, it's just that obviously somebody's gone and banged on about it on the forums and it's suddenly the thing to do, so everyone started off and do it. My personal point of view, I don't want to put down 100 coats of paint to try and cover black, okay? That's why pre-shading works for me because it gives me a subtleness that I can basically monitor. So i.e. we'll pre-shade this one in all the black around the panel lines, we'll just give it some squiggles and dots and mess everywhere just to change the colours. Then we're going to come in and then use that pre-shading to add uh, texture, depth and shadowing effects to the paintwork. So what I might do on something like this on the underside down here, uh, this area down the middle is lighter, these on the sides uh, are going to be darker. So I might put black down on the sides or just darken it up a bit, you know, a couple of sprays down here and leave this centre section. So when you come in with the paint, this looks cleaner than it does down here. But that's what it's all about, it's just different ways of doing the similar things and it's that personal choice. Some people love doing the black way and they'll do the black way all the time. For me, it's not for me. Did do it, wouldn't do it anymore because it just takes too long. It's too much flapping around and I think I can get the same results doing my way rather than that. And again, we're talking about that thing where it seems to be a new technique that's come out and then everyone runs off and do it. But sometimes the old techniques are the best. What works for you is should be your thing you know it's how you do it you've got a system you know it works it's fine it's great to try things because let's face it you might try it you might get on really well with the idea and then do all your work from it again but for me i know it i used it didn't like it come back to the way i did it before okay and everything else like that but as i said different things you know it's said that's what we're talking about if you do figures like wargaming and stuff like that because they're small it's not so much of a problem but when you start doing a you know i don't know a 30 second intruder black and then you've got to change its color that's a lot of paint that's a lot of layers you're going to have to bring that up through to do it and that will take forever uh small stuff i can understand it big stuff probably not okay and uh, steve says uh phil just a quick question uh do all the flory girls have names uh do you ever come up with a name for the pigment girl uh that i may have just missed yes we do we actually have um, obviously, have I got them here? Hold on. Hold on, we won't be able to show you. Oh, oh they do all have names. <laughs> Don't tell me we're one missing. Who are we missing? We are missing pigments. Where's pigments? Oh god, always the way. Where is pigments? <laughs> Wait, here we have a set of things without that.
Okay, we have them here. So, we do have the original, which was Mel, obviously, for our Melanie. Then we had Alex, okay, for obviously Ice Cold in Alex, following that one. Then we had the wash, which is Trace or Tracy, okay. And then we had Pigments, which is Lynn, which is our very own John Buller's wife, which was named after her. And obviously Tracy, named after our Tracy and Dave, Alex, Universal, and obviously Mel. So yeah, they all do have names. Oh, I prefer to run upstairs and grab that one. So there we go. Uh, right, how are we doing on this one? Uh, right, okay, Robert Wheeler. Hello Phil, greetings from West Virginia. Sorry if the question is a bit basic or stupid. No such thing. Trust me, we've all been there. We all are still ask him. I ask him all the time. I'm currently building the Meng Bradley uh, M3, A3, but not sure how to go about painting the machine gun or its metal color without getting it all over the turret uh, as it's in a bit of a hole. I was thinking I could take some Mr. Metal Iron uh, and if I did get some paint on the turret, it can look like chipping. Thanks for everything you do. My subscription is one of the best and favorite things modeling talks. Worth every penny. No problem, thank you. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, I wouldn't worry about it too much. As I say, if you get a little bit on the side, you could call it chipping and all the rest of it. Small brush, that's the secret. Um, I use these little guys here. These are these little eye brush applicator brushes. You pick them up, they are literally a couple of quid for a couple of hundred. And I use them two or three times and then when they start to fall apart, I bin them. But they've got very fine heads on there and literally just dab at it. Go in there and just dab it in, put it in there and away you go. And if you do get any on there around there, I wouldn't worry about it too much. And if you did, you could come back with the external color and just run it around the edges just to do it like that. You'd be absolutely fine. But again, I think that's one of those ones you would probably worry about more than doing it, okay? The other option is, of course, you can get a little bit of paper, slip it down the sides of it and then brush it. And then if you do get a bit on there, it will protect it and then take it away and do it like that. But honestly, small brush, steady hand and just get in there and give it the effect of and you should be absolutely fine with that one. That's what I did with mine anyway. So I'm not even sure I did get it on the side, may have done. Okay, so uh, last question I think today, we've got uh, Anthony says, hi Phil, quick question to regards primers. Have you any experience of Alclad micro filler gray? Uh, and if so, how good does the micro filler part of it work compared to other primers? What are your top tips uh, and views on primers? I only sprayed acrylics. I only spray acrylics, Tamiya guns, and occasionally extra acrylics. I used to use it. When it first came out, again, it's one of those things. We all ran off and bought it. And this is going back early 90s. Um, and I, again, I don't think it's any different from using something like a Mr. Surfacer. Uh, Mr. Surfacer, which uh, I got here, is it up? Yeah, Mr. Surfacer 1200, I think is pretty much the same stuff. It's very, very close. You can get this in a spray can as well. I've got a couple of cans of it up there. Um, um, that's really about the same type of thing. It's literally like a, um, as I say, it's like a basic primer. Some of the primers like Steinal Res now, even like the MIG stuff and, you know, Vallejo primers, the polyurethanes are very, very good. They've almost got this sort of micro filler uh, thing. What it's basically going to do is smooth out all of your imperfections, or that's the theory behind it. And that is like Mr. Surface 1200, which is something I used to do, not so much now with these modern uh, primers and things like that. But um, this stuff is obviously a hot product. It needs a lacquer. So you thin it with lacquers, 50-50 mix, spray it on, gives you a beautiful smooth finish. Really, really well. And basically is like a micro filler. Uh, I do it like that. Because you're an acrylics guy, I recommend Steinal Res. Simple as that. Where is my bottle of Steinal Res? Anyone nicked it? It was around somewhere. I can't even see it now. That's a good point. Where's my Steinal Res? I'm going to need it shortly. I have to have a look for that. I don't even know where it is. Um, but yeah, it's with the Steinal Res stuff, it's one of those things. It's uh, great gap, gap, can't speak, gap capabilities. Okay, so it is going to fill all those small little imperfections. And if it doesn't, it sands beautifully within a few minutes and you don't have any problem with it. It comes in a variety of colors as well. So obviously I just use gray, but if you wanted to, you've got reds, greens, blues, yellows, and everything now, as well as black. Okay, but that's what I would do from an acrylic painting point of view. If you're using acrylics, that's all you want to use, then obviously I do that. 
rather than using the sort of you know uh, the Alclad uh, micro pri micro filled primer. So yes, that's all it is. It's basically a um, sort of a gap capability one, which basically means you get small imperfections, it will smooth over them and give you a nice finish. But generally now, you just want to keep it smooth before you start. But Steinol Res, from an acrylic point of view, is beautiful stuff to use. So there we go, that's about it for this week. As I say, cover quite a lot in all of that lot. Hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, keep the questions coming. Love answering them. Remember, there's no such thing as a silly question. You know, at the end of the day, we've all got them. Some of them are more silly than others, but that's what makes it all part of the hobby. If you don't know it, it's not a silly question. It's as simple as that. So that's about it for me. Hopefully now, I'll get this edited and all the rest of it. We're now half past 12. I can get upstairs, get this thing ready for primer and all the rest of it if i can get it in primer today i'll be really happy and then tomorrow we can get on with pre-shading it and making the way through with that one and then hopefully i've got some nice kit reviews coming up at the end of the week i've got a couple of aircraft coming in i've got a couple of other bits and pieces a couple of tools various things coming in as well so looking forward to that uh, and then we can actually get going on the main terminator because that's going to give me just over a week to do the main terminator and as i say i've got the replacement barrels coming from them and they should be in at some point this week which you very excited about as well. So that's all for me this week. I'll catch you all next week with next week's Q&A's.